Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the May installment of ILA's Leadership Perspectives webinar series. I am Dr. Almarie Mundley from Regent University, and I will be moderating this webinar with Juana Bordas. With the, she is the president of the Mestiza Leadership International. Before we start, please note the following. First, this webinar will be archived. If you miss something or would like to hear the webinar again or would like to see the presentation again, they will be published to the ILA website shortly. You will receive an email with instructions for accessing the archive recording after the webinar has ended. Second, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar. At any time, you may ask questions by typing them into the questions box of your webinar control panel which is currently displayed on the right-hand side of your screen. We will address your questions during... Hello? 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 Can you Hi. hear me? I can hear you now, yes. This is one. Oh. Hello? Okay, I'm sorry. I think there was a malfunction with my microphone. Um, and I will uh, read again, Juana, if you don't mind, uh, from your affiliation onward. So we have Juana Bordas with us today. She is the president of Macisa Leadership International. And I will be moderating this webinar. This webinar will be archived. And if you miss something or would like to hear the webinar again or would like to see the presentation again, they will be published on the ILA website shortly. You will receive an email with instructions for accessing the archive recording after the webinar has ended. Second, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar. At any time, you may ask questions by typing them into the question box of your webinar control panel, which is currently displayed on the right-hand side of your screen. We will address your questions during the second portion of the webinar. Please note, however, that we may not be able to address each question we receive. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Juana Bordas is president of Mestiza Leadership International, a company that focuses on diversity, leadership, and organizational change. She is the founding president of the National Hispana Leadership Institute, and former faculty member for the Center for Creative Leadership. Juana was initiated into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, served as vice president of the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership, and a trustee of the International Leadership Association. She received Denver's 2008 Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Social Responsibility and the Leadership Legacy Award from Spelman College's Center for Leadership. For her extensive work with Latinas, she has commended by she is she was commended by Latina Style Magazine for creating a nation of Latina leaders. Her book, Salsa, Soul and Spirit, Leadership for a Multicultural Age, was awarded the 2008 International Latino Book Award for Leadership. Her new book, The Power of Latino Leadership is the first comprehensive book on how Latinos lead. In 2009, Juana was named Colorado Unique Woman of the Year by the Denver Post and the Colorado Women's Foundation. So let's welcome our speaker today, Juana Bordas. Thank you so much, Almeri. It's such a pleasure to be with the International Leadership Association, an organization that I, that I was with since it was just created, and it's doing such fabulous work with communities and countries across the world. So thank you all for joining me on this early morning. Buenos dias to everyone, and thank you for your interest in Latino leadership. Uh, one of the things I want to start with is that um, People are aware today of the growing Hispanic influence and the phenomena of the Latinization of America. And, you know, we've been seeing a lot of uh, magazines and articles and the last election of uh, the influence of Latinos. And so many people think that this is a recent phenomenon. But 
Latinos uh, have been here since before this was the U.S. and we know that our advancement has taken centuries and it's only because of the relentless activism of our leaders that we are where we are today. So this morning I'd like to talk a little bit ab about um, the, the foundations of leadership in the Latino community and get into some principles of how because of our status as a minority and also because of our unique history that we have some ways of leading that really can contribute uh, to the um, American landscape. So the first thing, uh, when you look at Latino leadership, um, I divided the book into five parts because Latino history is very complex. And because we don't learn the history of many of our, of our uh, minorities and people of color in, in, um, in our history books, it's not included. Um, many of us don't know uh, the history of, of how Latinos came to be. Um, so we have to start with that history, particularly for young Latinos, so they understand how we got to where we are and who we are as a people. There is also a special way that Latinos prepare for leadership. And um, I wanted to say at the beginning that in our country, we don't have a genre or um, a, a unique category for leadership. Leadership is listed under business. And, um, and, that, and we need a strong economy in order to have a, a, a strong country. But the purpose of leadership is not um, business. The purpose of leadership from a Latino perspective and a perspective from communities of color is to create the kind of society that lives our social values, the values we hold dear like community and equality, justice, pluralism, to build a kind of society that takes care of its people. And of course, part of that is business. So a Latino leader is basically designated a leader by his or her community because it's a conferred uh, position and it's based on contribution to the community. So when a leader begins to think about leadership, they have to prepare in a certain way that will really make them the kind of leader that people want to follow. Um, second of all, because it is leadership that grows out of a community, it's really based in the culture. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because some of the cultural values that Latinos have are exactly kind of the, the remedio or the remedy or the contribution that America needs to rebuild community and to have this kind of social netting and this sort of cooperation that we need in leadership today. And finally, I'm going to talk about five principles of how leadership is, in, is put into action and talk a little bit about Latino destino. What is it that Latinos are going to contribute to America today? So I hope we're ready to go. Um, I'm going to start with um, Latino fusion and hybrid vigor. Um, the Latino experience is very different than the experience of, um, of the Anglo-Saxon community or people that came from other parts of Europe because the Spanish were already the mestizos or the mixed people of Europe. At the time that um, America was settled, there were Arabs and Muslims and Jews in, in Europe. The uh, northern uh, Europeans were in the, in the northern part of, of Spain. And so Spain was already this incredible, uh, rich cultural mixture. And uh, so when the conquistadors came here, there were two things that happened. One is that they already were a mixed, a mixed people. And second of all, that um, the Catholic Church, which was uh, the faith of Spain at that time, and you have to remember that Spain was the ruler of the world in those days, um, the Catholic Church said, no, uh, you know, we have to remember that the Indian and the indigenous people are uh, humans. You, know, you have to really treat them with the respect. And they came here to convert. Latinos or to convert the indigenous people into the Catholic faith. So it had a, a different perspective. And when the Spanish came here, they began to mix it at a very high level with the indigenous people. Very different experience than what happened in, northern, um, in the northern hemisphere. Um, so about 12 years after the conquest, there was this apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I put that in there because she's so revered, not only by the Latino community, but she was proclaimed the empress of this hemisphere by the Catholic Church. And what was important about her is that whether you believe it as a myth or whether you believe it as, um, as, as a spiritual reality, 
the, the thing that was important about her is that she appeared as a mestiza. She appeared as half Indian, half um, Spanish. And, um, and that was what was happening at that time, this mixture. But she also had a vision, and that vision was that she was the mother of all the races that would come to this continent, all of us, and that she was there to proclaim that we should um, learn to live with each other with compassion and peace. And so she put forth the vision of the multicultural future. And this was only 12 years after the Spanish had come to this hemisphere, and it was before uh, the Westerners from the northern part of Europe uh, had come to this continent. And so um, when, when uh, especially Mexican Americans and other Latinos look at Our Lady of Guadalupe, we see a miracle. We, we see the power of a new birth, of, of a, new, a new people that were coming, um, a, a fusion people, a hybrid people. And, um, and this is like the, the, the genesis story of who Latinos are. And from there, we go into a very long Spanish-Hispanic legacy in the US. And um, what happened was is that um, this cultural fusion began to take place. And um, the Spanish were the first Europeans in um, the northern and southern hemispheres uh, here. And uh, they laid the railroads and had the first churches. St. Augustine was the first city. So they, there was a, this incredible legacy of, of the Spanish. And so as this fusion began to take place, the Latino culture began to emerge. Now, Latinos are not a race. They are a culture, a fusion culture of the Spanish, the Indian, and other Europeans. We are an ethnic group, much like the Jewish community. So you can be Polish and be Jewish. You can be Israeli. You can be Sephardic Jew, which is Spanish and, and Jewish. And much like the Jewish community, Latinos are an ethnic group. We have a shared history that comes out of um, this mixture of the indigenous and Spanish people. We share a language. 80% of Latinos speak some Spanish at home. We have a common spiritual tradition. And uh, the majority of Latinos were raised in a Catholic tradition, but it's very different than, than a northern Catholic tradition. But what really unites us is a core set of values. Uh, because culture is learned, and we learn it through our values. So here is the Latino fusion, if you'll watch this. So you can see the Spanish, the Indian, the mix, the Moorish, um, all of Central and South America, this incredible fusion that took place. And this never has happened, where you have this many people participate in, in this kind of phenomena, where different cultures and races come together to form something new. And that's the Latino or Hispanic tradition in, in this continent. Now, all of us like Mexican food. It's America's favorite cuisine. And you can see the fusion when you sit down and you got um, a Mexican plate, and it has beans and rice. Beans come from the indigenous tradition. They were here in this hemisphere. Rice comes, of course, from Europe, but it, um, originally came from, um, from the east. If you get a corn tortilla, which is on my right, that's indigenous. If you get a flour tortilla, that's Spanish. If you look at squash, which is very popular in the Latino community, you look at squash, you look at um, uh, chili, you look at um, uh, tomatoes, avocados, those were all here. But if you look at chorizo and some of the other things, paella and some of the other food that Latinos love, that's Spanish. So when you, even when you look at our dinner table, you see the fusion of culture coming together. The other thing we need to remember when we think about the Latino phenomenon and what's going on in this country, that 170 years ago, one third of the United States was Mexico. Mexico lost half of its territory during the Mexican-American War. And I put up the, the first, um, I, I like to call this person the first John Wayne, because he, he is one of the Spanish ranchers that taught the Texans and the New Mexicans and all the people who came how to ranch. And we talked about the Spanish laying the foundation. So meanwhile, this culture uh, is, is beginning to surface. And um, Florida, of course, was the first Spanish European settlement. And that went all the way into Georgia. So when you look at the Latinization of America, it has very old roots. It was here before we became a, a country. 
The other thing that happened because of this cultural fusion is that Latinos are diversity. And um, what futurists and, and leadership experts are saying is that diversity is the challenge of this century. We're moving to a multicultural nation. We're moving to a global community. So Latinos are black, Latinos, they're brown, they're yellow, Chino Latinos, they're white, they're red because of our indigenous background. We're cafe, latte, and mestizo. We are a mixture. And that mixture shows up in the 2010 census. Now you'll notice the majority of Latinos are Mexican, and that's because of our history. But if you look over on the left, you will see that we're Central and South Americans, we're Puerto Ricanos, we're El Salvadorians, Cubans, and Dominican. And the diversity in the Latino community is actually growing. In the 2010 census, the Salvadorians and the Dominicans showed up for the first time. So again, we see this mixture, not only of, of, um, of races, but of nationalities. Um, to the point where um, Jose Valenzuano, the Mexican philosopher, educator, politician, called this mixture la raza cosmica, or the cosmic race. And he predicted that eventually humankind would become this rainbow community, but that it would be led by the browns or the brown race, or not race because we're not a race, but people uh, of the Americas. The other thing that's real important to understand with the um, Latino phenomenon is that our immigration pattern is very different. Um, we have on the right uh, the statue of our, um, of, of our Lady of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty, and many of the European settlers came through the, the northern part of our United States. Latinos, on the other hand, their homeland is right across the border, and I was just in Texas. It's right there. And, um, and so there's a different kind of an immigration pattern that continued into this century. And until the last decade, 40 to 50 percent of Latino growth is immigration. So unlike people who came in the past who gave up their culture and language and didn't go back regularly to their homelands, um, Latinos, uh, the immigrants, are revitalizing our cultural core. So I'm an immigrant. And I came to this country um, with my mother and um, my seven brothers and sisters. And so as I grew up, I grew up with a bicultural identity. I'm an American, but I'm also a Latina. I'm also a Nicaraguan. And I'm also a Mestiza because I'm of mixed race. And so here are the immigrants coming and revitalizing um, the, the core. Um, the other thing that makes this, and, and I'm getting to a point here, so hold on. And this is one of the principles of leadership in the Latino community. We call it global vision and immigrant spirit. We have a global vision because Latinos come from countries across the world. Spain was the ruler of the world at the time that the conquistadors came. So here we have 20 nation states in the America, Puerto Rico, who's actually a commonwealth. We have two former colonies in Africa, where Spanish is the official language, the Philippines, and Los Estados Unidos, or the United States. And so what we have with Latinos is a vision of, of a global community. And um, today, Latinos still identify with their country of origins. So we know that we have diversity as a leadership challenge. We know we are going towards a global community. And both of these things are things that the Latino community has been working with and grappling with um, since their inception. The immigrant spirit is important because America was founded by immigrants. Half the businesses in the United States today, the small businesses, are started by immigrants. And we know from our country's history that immigrants bring innovation. They're looking for opportunity. They're on the cutting edge of their cultures because they're leaving to find, to find new vistas. Um, so America was settled by this incredible dynamic spirit of immigrants, and Latinos are keeping that immigrant spirit alive today. Um, the other thing about the global vision is the idea of speaking other languages, <clears throat> and Spanish is the second most common spoken language in the world. And the difference is, is that Chinese, which is first, is, is basically, and it's a great language to learn, but it's basically in one area of the world, whereas if you speak Spanish, you can speak to people in all of these countries and across the globe. So all of these things lead up to a different phenomena for Latinos in America. America uh, Latinos are not assimilating. We are not giving up our culture. 
we are borrowing between diverse peoples. We are creating a new blend. We are acculturating and bringing our gifts into the mainstream. So here's a picture of how young Latinos are changing America. And one historical fact, I think, that is really important for leadership is that Latinos were not declared a, a minority or an identified group in the United States until the 1980 census. So they're a young group. Before that, people identified uh, on the census through their country of origins. Uh, they would put down Nicaraguan or El Salvadorian or Mexican or Mexican-American or Chicano, which is a more political term, or Puerto Rican. And so in the 1980 census, this conglomerate of people were brought together under one umbrella as Hispanics. And so we're still in the identity formation age, I mean, period, and our leaders our leaders have the challenge of bringing this diversity together. So how do we forge a, an identity? And once we can do that, we can be a model for America on how we can all um, come from different countries, different nationalities, different ethnic groups, different colors, but together uh, we're one people. So Latinos are acculturating, and young Latinos are identifying with being Latino at a higher rate than their parents because of this new phenomena of Latinos becoming an identified group. So um, do we have any questions so far? Hello? 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 Hello, Juana? Yes, do we have any Juana? questions? Yes. Yes, there is a question at this time, and I will read it. Uh, it comes from one of our um, uh, one of our uh, members in the um, ILA network. Are the terms Hispanic and Latino used completely interchangeably? Is there any preference or differentiation within the community? That is a great question, and um, thank you for asking it. Um, Hispanic is an older term in the sense, I mean, if you can call it older. Um, and of course, it comes from the old um, name of Spain, which was Hispania. And when the government, and, and it actually brought people together. I know Leo Estrada, a demographer who was brought in by the US government back when they were trying to get a term for Latinos. And I actually cover that in my book about how this whole thing happened. And they picked Hispanic um, at that time. So if you look at some of our organizations that are 25 years old, like the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility, or the National Hispana Leadership Institute, our older organizations have the word Hispanic in it. Mm -hmm. Latino, on the other hand, is, is a preferred term, by, especially by many young people, because of the connection with Latin America. But the interesting phenomenon is, is that that comes from the Latin languages that came from when the Romans, we were talking about Spain being so diverse, well, the Romans were there. Hmm. And the aqueducts are still there. And so, you know, sometimes you'll see a Latino with a Roman nose, and I'm serious, start looking for this. And so, um, so that's the term that is, in a sense, a preferred, but in a study by Pew, the Hispanic Research Center, it said that most Hispanics are, are, are comfortable with both words, although the majority are still using Hispanic, but Latino is beginning to be used more, I think, with our young people. But you feel free to use them interchangeably. Okay, and, and along those lines, Juana, as you're mentioning the Latino and Hispanic terminology, we've got a second question here that may uh, bring in, shed more information on how these communities work. You mentioned the word Chicano as a political term. Can you elaborate further? And this is a question coming in from one of our listeners. Um, I did mention the word Chicano. That was a very popular term in the Southwest, particularly in Texas and California, where traditionally half of Latinos have lived in this country because of, of uh, the fact of the Mexican uh, history. Um, and so um, I just forgot what I was talking about. 
<laughs> well, you mentioned the word Chicano as a political yeah, Chicano term. Chicano as a, a word during, there was actually quite a political period, which we're going to talk about, because one of the principles of Latino leadership is, is social activism, because our leaders have had to bring people that were underrepresented, underemployed, undereducated, up from the bottom, bottom up. So it's, it's a kind of a seasick way they were, yes, we can, leadership. And so during the 1960s, there was this movement of the Chicano movement. There was, it was during civil rights. And many of the Mexican Americans in particular, because you have to realize that's the group that was really colonized. The people that are coming from Central and South America are coming from nationalities where they were the majority. So we're basically talking about Latinos who have been here for generations. Some of them have been here seven generations before this was a nation. And so there was the Brown Berets, there was the Chicano movement, there was Cesar Chavez. So we had a very activist period in the 1960s. And, um, and so Chicano kind of represents a politically aware and active, um, uh, mainly Mexican-American, but, but many of us honor the term because it represents our, our activist tradition. Excellent, excellent. So I'm going to kind of speed it up if that's OK for folks. That's fine. We're almost yes. halfway through. So when you're looking at leadership that comes out of a community, it has to be founded on the culture. And the first dynamic of the Latino culture that forms our leadership is that we are a we culture. We're a familia culture, a community culture, a collective culture. So our leadership has always been collective, even though today we, we're seeing leadership move into a more collaborative, collective team orientation. This has been traditionally the way Latinos lead. Second of all, because it is about familia, people always come first in the Latino community, serving others. A Mexican-American will actually introduce themselves and say, ¿Cómo puede servirte? How can I serve you? And so this whole idea of serving others has been part, and that servant leadership, community stewardship has been part of, of leadership. Um, the other thing about that is that um, even in the Spanish language, dame lo, the me comes before the thing. So it's person and then thing. So we're not a, um, a, a materialistic culture. In fact, Latinos spend more money on food, on fiesta, on quinceañeras, on going out to eat, on being with the family, on music, and other groups that, that, you know, because we want to enjoy our families and enjoy life. So what you have, in, um, in, and I picked out four values that have to do with leadership, is the first one is respeto, and that's respect. And the Latino, in the Latino tradition, you have to respect everyone, regardless of status, regardless of what they do, whether the person is the head of the organization or cleans the airport, because I work with airports. And the good leaders know the names of the people that are cleaning, that are doing the maintenance. They're treating everybody with the same respect. And that levels the playing field and brings about the leader is equal. The other one is honesty. And we're, that's something that, again, is needed in all uh, leaders. But in the Latino community, it's been the oral tradition. Um, and we're going to go next to some of the um, ways Latinos learn this. But the whole idea of my word is law, mi palabra es la ley, mm -hmm. Latinos would shake hands, no contracts, no lawyers. This is my word. I'm honest. I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. Then this idea of being simpatico, and simpatico, if everybody can say it to themselves, I'm simpatico means I'm easy to get along with. People like me. I'm congenial. I do for others. I'm generous. I'm available. You can't have a people-centered culture and have it your way. It has to be all of us together getting along. And so Latinos are cooperative. Um, that they like to work together. Um, and it's, a, it's just centered around people. And finally, the idea of generosity, because you can't have a people-centered culture without people being generous and giving of themselves. So a Latino leader or is not respected by how much they accumulate, but how generous they are and how much they give. This is encapsulated in one of the most famous Latino dichos. And those are sayings, like the early bird gets the worm is one from the Anglo culture. Mi casa es su casa is kind of um, a foundational saying. And it means, my house is your house. But it also means what I have is yours. 
And it creates a culture where, um, first of all, it's more fluid about material things. Um, uh, it's not acquis acquisitional. Um, we save the best for guests. You know, my mother would hide chocolates, you know, we would be looking for them because she would hide things so that when guests came, we could give them our best. And um, mi casa es tu casa, when you look at it as a leadership thing, it means am I generous with my time? Um, do I give of myself? Am I involved in my community? Am I respected because of my contributions? A am I a generous person? And am I helping others uh, empower themselves if I'm a leader? So that's a, a, a dicho that's very important to Latinos, and it, and it symbolizes our generosity, our respect for people, our ability to share, and our idea that we have to get along if we're going to move forward. So this is some fun Latino dichos. And um, if culture is the basis of leadership, well, let's look at how Latinos learn leadership. The first one is called hágalo con orgullo, and this is gusto, organas. Do it with pride. Do it with uh, energy. Do it with passion. And that's the, the, um, the value of excellence and of doing it you know, the best you can with energy. Dime con quien andas. Tell me who you hang out with, and I'll tell you who you are. And that one is about people again. And we know that walking your talk, leadership by emulation, is the most important thing we can do. Model the way. Well, here's Latinos, mothers and fathers saying, OK, who do you hang out with? Who are you going to be like? You know, uh, how are you going to be a role model for your, your, older, your younger brothers and sisters? You need to watch who you, who you hang out with and, and what kind of a person you are. Then we have a saying called hombre de palabra, a man of my word could be a woman of my word today. And that's what we were talking about. You keep your word. You do what you say you're going to do. Um, mi palabra es la ley, my word is law, is another one. And so Latinos believe you do what you say you're going to do. And so that's kind of a, another um, uh, key point in the culture. Then we have some women having a really good time. And there's a saying in the Latino culture, echele agua al caldo, put another cup of the soup. Or you can always put another cup of water in the soup. And that represents our ability to share, but also our resourcefulness. You know, Latinos have come out of a, a, a very difficult economic um, uh, situation. Um, I grew up low income. Um, my parents, my mother had a fifth grade education. And yet, she always could take one chicken and make it work for 10 people on Sundays when we had our Sunday dinner. Because she knew how to echar agua al caldo. She knew how to be resourceful. She knew how to stretch things. She had knew to, how to do more with less. And so Latinos have constantly learned that leadership principle that we have to not only take care of our resources, but that our resources can be shared. Uh, one of my favorites is a shrimp on the right-hand side. And this uh, is camarón que se duerme, se lo lleva el corriente. If a shrimp sleeps, it's going to be carried away by the current. And I love this one because it teaches you to be aware. It teaches you to be proactive, which is the number one habit of highly effective people. It teaches you to check out the current. You know, what's the, what's the current here? What's the environment? Um, uh, you know, how can I get along here? What do I need to do in order to succeed? So your mother never had to say the whole thing. If you were slacking off, she would just say, camarón, and you were supposed to listen up and pay attention and figure out what you needed to do next. And then an interesting one, and what I want you to do is just get a feeling for how leadership comes out of this cultural soil. El que no trabaja no come. Everybody works. If you don't work, you don't eat. And again, Latinos believe in um, everybody giving everybody respect, everybody's equal, everybody contributes, everybody works, everybody does their share. So those are some of the cultural foundations of leadership in our community. So I just want you to take a minute, now that you've heard a little bit about our culture, before we move into leadership, and write down a little bit about, if you're Latino, what about that I've said has made you proud. If you're not Latino, but you're looking at our culture and going, boy, these people really did do a lot. They really got it going on. Why do you admire Latino? So just jot it down for yourself. And then the word suave means smooth or way to go. So suave. Now, all of this has been leading us to a very important piece of my work. And that is, because culture is learned, 
because Latinos are a culture, because inclusiveness and generosity is part of our culture, and because it is a humanistic culture where the most important thing in our lives are people. People can become Latino by corazón because Latinos are not a race. The way you become Latino, it's the only group that self-identifies. To be black, they had the drop of one black, you know, one drop of uh, blood uh, in our history. To be American Indian, you have to be registered with a tribe. You know, there's different ways people, in, in a racial perspective, identify with a race. But we're not a race. And so, in order to become Latino, it's a self-selected check the box on the census. So now, in my family, I like to say that my family is like a box of assorted chocolates. And we have all different kinds of people in the family, but we also have people who have become Latino by affinity or corazón because they married mm -hmm. into the family. Uh, they love the culture. I say if you hang out with Latinos long enough, the rhythm is going to get you because it's a, it's a celebratory culture. It's a culture that values you, that um, where leaders are trying to grow the best potential of their people. And it has what's called a bienvenido spirit, an inclusive, welcoming spirit. And so one of the things that Raul Isaguerre, the great uh, civil rights leader of the last century, says, he says Latinos are going to change America's race consciousness because we're not a race. We believe that if you share our values, if you want to work together, if you have a vision of the kind of society you want, we want to create, if you want to do leadership that empowers people, then bienvenido, welcome to the family, he says. And so I'm inviting you to become Latino by corazón, to learn about our culture, and to uh, join with us in creating um, the good society. So from there, we want to look at how Latinos put leadership into action. And the first principle I call juntos, which means together, uh, because our leadership has always been collective, has come out of the community, and has come out of stewardship of our leaders uh, being good stewards or servant leaders to the community and to the people that they serve. The second one we've already talked about, and I call it adelante, which means moving forward, and that's the fact that Latinos have a excuse me, global vision and an immigrant spirit. And um, part of that uh, global vision not only includes the different countries, but it also includes that Latinos have an intergenerational leadership approach. And so you, you know, Latino leadership can go from our ancianos or our, 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 our trusted elders all the way to our very young people. And at a Latino event, you'll see you know, from young children to people in their 80s and 90s. So uh, uh, that, that's an important thing that we're really looking at, at our young people. Then we talked a little bit already about Si Se Puede, social activism and coalition leadership. And for those of you that asked about the Chicano movement, Si Se Puede comes out of that. It means, yes, we can. And uh, uh, Obama admitted that he got this from us, by the way. And Si Se Puede means, yes, we can do it. It's not I can do it. It's we can do it, collective social acti activism. And we'll see that most of Latino organizations are coalition leadership organizations. And, and that one of the challenges of our leaders is how do you work with Cubans and Puerto Ricans and Mexican Americans and the du new Dominicans and the immigrants? So it's a very interesting coalition leadership that our, that our leaders have had to do. And one thing that Latinos contribute is um, leadership that celebrates life. And that's called gozar la vida, or enjoy life. And um, if you go to a Latino conference, we have music. I have danced with most of our leaders because we dance together. Uh, we, we, we always serve food is a, a Latino golden rule in leadership. Um, but it's just the whole idea that if you want people to do the hard work for centuries of community organizing, of moving forward step by step, you have to celebrate life. And then finally, Latinos, if you look at um, studies on Latinos, uh, the, the two highest uh, values we have is faith and family. But I want to say a little bit about Latino faith. Uh, it really is about social responsibility. It's, it's, it's faith that says we have a responsibility to take care of each other. And hope, esperanza, because we've had to work together for many, many years. In fact, last year I celebrated 50 years of activism which started when I was um, a junior in college and marched to integrate the University of Florida. 
So one thing that is important for people to understand about Latino leadership is that we're moving towards the Latinization of America. Today, one in six Americans are Latino. We're growing at a 43% rate, but when you look at and leaders have to have the vision of the multicultural society that's coming, of the mosaic society that's coming. How do we prepare our students, if you're with a university, who are 18 years old and 20 years from now they're going to turn around and one out of three Latin, uh, um, or one out of four um, Americans will be Latino. So this democratic, demographic explosion is really important because it's saying, you know, yes, you're welcome to join with us, but we're going to have a dominant force in, in, in this century. Um, for Latinos, they have the highest participation of any group in the labor market. And by 2050, 55% of American workers will be Hispanic. And a real comparison to what's happening in this century with Latinos is what's happening, what happened to women in the last century. Women began the last century being 18% of the workforce and today are the majority. And if we look at our economy, if we look at leadership, if we look at our society, women have had this tremendous impact. And the paradigm shift is, is that women are going to be leaders in this century. Well, Latinos are going the same way. Their paradigm shift is beginning to happen. And by 2050, you who are uh, in the workforce or our young people who are in the workforce, the majority of people will be Latino. Uh, one other thing, um, for Latinos, <clears throat> and you'll see this, you'll see immigrants working, <clears throat> putting on roofs, digging ditches, serving food at fast food restaurants. My mother worked in a school lunchroom serving food, cleaning floors, doing what she could do for the mm -hmm. vision that she had for me and her children. And work is seen as a way to contribute. We saw, el que no trabaja, no comen. Everybody has to work. But it doesn't matter if I dig ditches or if I serve food in the lunchroom. I'm contributing to my family. I have dignity. So it's a different way. If I'm working, I'm contributing. So we don't have the same idea, which feeds back into the leader is equal, which feeds back to respeto for every individual, regardless of whether I'm cleaning the, the, the office or I'm the president of the university, I have dignity because I'm supporting myself and my family. So when Latinos look at preparing themselves for leadership, there's an important concept which we've been talking about, and it's called personalismo, the person. Who are you as a leader, and how do you treat other people? So personalismo means I have to become the kind of person that earns respect, that earns trust, that is honest and loyal, other-centered, community-minded. And that's a picture of Raul Segetti, who was born in the Valley of South Texas at the time when there were signs, no Mexicans, no dogs, in the windows of, re of Mexican restaurants, of, of uh, Texas restaurants. And his hallmark is treating everybody with the same respect that he treats. And he's been on the Sears board, and he's been, he was the vice vice chair or the co-chair of Hillary's campaign. He's now the ambassador of the Dominican Republic. And if he walked in, he would be like, like your uncle Raul or your uncle Bob or your uncle, you know, he would just be like someone in your family. So the first thing Latinos have to do is take a good look at their lives and, and how they're going to become the kind of person people would follow and how they're going to become a person of confianza or trust, a person that other people have confidence in that they will follow through. Second of all, there's a thing called conciencia. And these are things that are in the leadership literature. This is just a Latino lens. And this is that you have to have consciousness or conscious awareness to become a leader. Who are you? You have to be secure. This is my first Latino mentor, Bernie Valdez, and he told me, you have to be secure. You have to know who you are and have respect for yourself in order to help others have respect for themselves. And for Latinos, it's a little bit different because we have to find our cultural identity. You know, we, we, especially those who have been here. I've been here since I was three years old. I grew up in, a, in, a, in a, an Anglo school district. You know, I never had a Latino teacher. I went and joined the Peace Corps, went back to South America, went to Chile to find out who am I as a Latina because in the 1960s, we didn't exist. So Latinos have to deal with their conciencia, who am I culturally. Then we have to resolve the issues of exclusion. And that has to do with many things because as I was growing up a minority in the United States, I had an inferiority complex. I was not, I did not think I had the right stuff to be able to succeed because I grew up in a culture where 
who I was wasn't represented in the leadership field or wasn't represented by uh, successful people. And there's a whole dynamic around the psychology of oppression and what happens to people when they're not validated for who they are. And second of all, this has, or third of all, this has to be collective because if I'm sitting here and feeling like I don't have the right stuff and don't realize that it's a socio-economic dynamic, that it has to do with the history of how this country was settled, I'm going to think it's me. I'm going to think something's wrong with me. And just like women came together in the last century to do um, consciousness raising groups and to talk about being raised as women, so Latinos have to understand how has this exclusion resulted in the, the status our society has in, 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 in our country. And then finally, Latinos look at Destino. Um, and this is Mayor Castro, uh, the youngest mayor of a major American city. He says, I believe in Destino. I am where I belong. I am in my place. I was born in San Antonio. I grew up here. And I want to bring opportunity to the people here. And so when you look at my book, you'll see Latinos saying, yes, there is destiny. And destiny is not prescribed. It's a dance. You know, life brings me certain opportunities. I take those. I open that door. I walk forward. And yet, it's the, um, I like to say that in, in the Anglo community or dominant culture, they say, I'm the captain of my ship. And I say, yeah, I'm the captain of my ship at the waters and the, the rough currents that life may bring or the fact that life brings uh, uh, different things to me also affects my destino. So it's a dance with life. It's my ability to forge my destiny. It's my ability to understand what life is bringing me. So there's a good section on destino and five uh, ways of, of knowing what your destino is. So let me, oh, I'm sorry. OK, let me get these up. This is Juntos, Collective Community Stewardship. And there's four principles. One is shared vision. And I have examples there. It's not a shared vision just in an organization. The Latino Policy Forum, 450 people coming together to look at what the vision is. It's really a, a community type of vision. Then the idea that. All of the leadership programs I start, we start with our history, much like we started today, but more in depth. What is my personal history? Where do I come from? And what are the cultural traditions that bring us together as a people? If you're going to get people to work together, you have to honor their history, honor their culture. The next one is compartir, which means to share. And that leadership is about everyone participating and about shared responsibility. And the last one is, in order for Latinos to advance, it has been centuries of paso a paso, a step-by-step -step approach. And this is Mayor Castro again talking about this collective community stewardship. He's saying, Latinos are simply more communal and more inclusive. If everyone chips in and does his or her part, things get done quicker, relationships become stronger, and we can all have a good time. And so uh, here's one of our young leaders talking about this, this process of collective community stewardship. And I had the opportunity uh, for my book to interview uh, Hilda Solis, the first Latino on a president's cabinet who was Secretary of Labor, um, Arturo Vargas, who runs the National Association of Latino Elected and Political Officials. And so the words of the Latino leaders uh, ring out in the, um, in, the, in the book. Here is Paso a Paso. And this is Raul Isaguerre. Um, this is a picture of me. I'm holding the baby at mi casa, about 30 two years ago. Um, and this was an organization that's now 35 years old that was built on these principles of collective community stewardship. And while Luis Aguirre says, we have to have a strategy of little victories. We can change things, but in bite-sized pieces. Leaders need to think big, but it's the little successes that build people's confidence. Having both a long-term vision and building sequential steps, paso a paso, keeps people moving and motivated. As people succeed, their vision of what is possible to accomplish becomes wider and more expansive. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the tributes to our leaders is that they've kept moving step by step, day by day, people by people to build our community. And this is Arturo Vargas that I just talked about. And this is a, a principle of leadership that comes under the collective community stewardship. And it's called leadership by the many, inclusive leadership. And Arturo is saying, if people are waiting for the great brown hope, give it up. It ain't going to happen. Instead, we have thousands and thousands of leaders working collectively every day throughout our communities. That's the new model of Latino leadership. And it's inclusive leadership. And so when I say welcome to the table, uh, Latinos have this idea that 
we're not going to have one voice. We're going to have many voices. Uh, you can be a leader in your school, in your community, in your job. You can be a leader in your university, wherever you are. And that's much more empowering than looking up to one person as the leader. It's hard because you have many people to deal with. But on the other hand, it's creating a movement of leaders across this country. And this is just Isagede talking about the leader among equal. And I'll just go through this really quickly because we've talked about it. He says we value many of the same values, but there's a sense of humility, modesty, and courtesy. And when the uh, National Association of, of Latino Community Leadership did a study on Latinos and their leadership, they found that people want us to be humble, modest, and courteous. And that was very different than the other studies that have been done on leaderships across the country because we want our leaders to stay part of the community, to stay just like everyone else, and to treat everyone the same. Now, <clears throat> Latinos have actually become more um, active or socially active because of immigration. And you know we could have left immigrants behind, but it would have been against our principles and against who we are as a people. And so immigration has actually become a unifying force for our community, and that makes me very proud that we are not leaving people behind. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to have an underclass. We're going to try to raise them up with us. Many of our parents are immigrants. I'm an immigrant. My parents are immigrants. Our Hugo Vargas's parents are immigrants. Hilda Solis's parents are immigrants. Janet Mugia, whose parent who heads up the National Council of Raza, her parents are immigrants. It's it's a close experience for us. And here's Arturo Vargas saying, we see each other as extended family. I see old Latinos as if they are my parents who are immigrants. I want to give them the same respect I give my mother and father. And so we strive for a leadership. Carlos Orta, president of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility. My drive and motivation comes from a place of service and righting wrongs. I truly believe that I have been given many opportunities and have the responsibility to give back. So that drives our Si Se Puede leadership, social activism and coalition leadership. I have three Hispanic organizations there, but we could have others. The Cuban National American Council, CNH, they changed their mission to include you and everyone. They bring together groups from all over the country. The Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility, a coalition of the 16 largest Hispanic national organizations that serve Mexicans and Cubans and Puerto Ricans and all of our community. The National Council of La Raza, over 400 organizations coming together to look at what we can do collectively as a community to lift, to lift our people. Our numbers alone don't equate strength or power unless we leverage them. Those numbers will just be numbers unless we take action to empower our communities. That's the strength of NCLR and our other organizations. They take specific actions to grow our voice as a community. We're almost done, so I want to leave some questions for um, uh, time for questions. This is Hilda Solis, who just stepped down as a Secretary of Labor. And again, her father uh, was a uh, union worker. He took a leadership role. There were 300 workers, most of them were Mexican, and couldn't speak a word of English. He helped them organize and mobilize them and won great concessions. He did not get there by sitting in the back of the room quietly. He was outspoken. He knew he could make change and a difference, and he did. And Janet Wagia talks about her father working in a factory, and they wouldn't let Mexicans, this was in Kansas, go to the bathroom. Uh, it, it, because the bathroom was not there for Mexicans. And one day he stood up and he said, I'm a man, and I'm going to the restroom. And she said they never stopped the Mexicans from going to the restroom again. And finally, we have leadership that celebrates life. Um, as you know, salsa is a dance. It's a condiment, but it's a way of life. To have salsa in your life is to enjoy your life, enjoy your family, uh, to, to um, have passion for your work. Uh, so Latinos are bringing uh, passion to leadership. We, um, we have charisma. Many of our leaders have that sense of being able to motivate people through the oral tradition. Cariño, because we love our leaders. Cariño means um, uh, affection um, and, and, and heart, corazón, and passion. And so Latinos believe that we work hard, but we have to celebrate life. And finally, we have been sustained by hope and courage. Mm -hmm humility, and forgiveness. And Janet Mugia says, with God, con Dios por delante, everything is possible. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was this sense that we shouldn't believe people anytime they say, you can't do that, or no. 
but to know that all things are possible with God's help. So I'd like to open it up for questions now. Yes, gracias, Juana. This has been incredible and so revealing. I want to thank you for the inspiration you are providing all of us. And um, coming off this presentation, I must admit, and, and uh, I, I would think everyone would like to be part of this community uh, because of the great statements you've made. Also, you've revealed some clearly the heart of who the Latino community is. And uh, you've also included great examples for us to understand what it means to lead from a Latino perspective. So I want to thank you for doing that, for clarifying, for revealing, and for inspiring. It has been truly wonderful to be a part of this session with you, Juana. And again, for those of us who may have joined a little bit uh, after our beginning moment at noon, this is Juana Bordas with the um, Mestiza Leadership International. She is the president of this great organization. So to end this session, Juana, I, I have a comment from one of our members who is um, seeking a little more uh, information about working among the commun amongst these communities of Latinos. Um, and as she heard your presentation, you had mentioned um, uh, you know, you had mentioned these various uh, groups in the Latino community. But in this question particularly, this person is uh, interested in expatriate leadership in Ecuador. Uh, and this is what she says, I have found that a hierarchical form of leadership is common in government, business, NGOs, and other forms of organization. How would you explain a hierarchical form of leadership in a community slash familia culture? Uh, that's a great question, and I think if if um, you know if she's talking about Ecuador and South America, we do have to realize that U.S. Latinos are experiencing a unique acculturation experience because all of us to be where we are. Janet Mugia has a law degree. Uh, all of us, to be where we are, have had to participate in the American U.S. culture. And we're proud of that. We're proud of being uh, Hispanic Americans. And so the way we lead is very different than you might find in Central and South America because our leaders have been community stewards because we've been minorities, because we've been colonized, because we've been underrepresented in, in uh, economic and educational systems. So that's what makes it different. South America, on the other hand, still has the remnants of the hierarchical type and European type leadership that really came from the conquistadors. Um, and the second piece of that is that it has a class structure that we don't have. I mean, one of the reasons I read, wrote this book is I want young Latinos to understand how we got here. Because if they understand how we got here, they can understand how we can get to the next level. But more than that, we want them to take their values and to make their contribution to America, not to assimilate, but to take these great values that we have to reinvigorate the American landscape. So it's a very different phenomena when you look at Central and South America and then you look at the United States. Because of our status as minorities, because of our history, and because of the fact that um, our leaders have had to grow our community and empower individual leaders. Excellent. Thank you so much, Juana. We actually have run out of time, believe it or not. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything further. Uh, we, we have a few moments left on the clock here, just a few seconds. And again, well, I just want to... I, I would appreciate it if, if people would buy my book because I am trying to get um, the book into uh, different universities and organizations. Um, it's 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 very entailed. It's 240 pages because I really tried to cover the whole thing. But I really want to say again that um, our leaders are saying that we're an inclusive community and that what we want to do is bring diversity and to, oh, you know what I want to do? Just one second. I do want to do this. Just, okay. just hold on, folks, because okay. I want to talk about Latino Destino. That'll be the best way to end it. Um, this is two of our Hispanic Heritage themes. 
um, I believe that Latino Destino is to build a diverse and humanistic society. That we are here to show people how inclusion, diversity, mixing it up, being a fusion people, being multicultural, and that's the fastest growing identification by millennials, multicultural. And that that's where our power comes from as, as a humankind. And second of all, to re, uh, reinstate the humanistic values that our society was founded on. And so you can look at Hispanic Heritage Month last year, Diversity United, Building America's Future Today. Diversity United, many backgrounds, many stories, one American spirit. And so I hope as you go forward, you'll, you'll really see how Latinos are here to contribute to a more diverse and more people-centered society, and that you'll join with us in creating this new America. Absolutely, absolutely, and as always, it's an honor to be a part of your, um, a part of this session, uh, Juana, and also to be a part of your life and what you're bringing to the Latino community of the United States. What uh, an inspiration today, and what a terrific presentation. Thank you so much. Thank so you I would so like much. It was my honor. Thank you, thank you. At, y mil gracias, I should say. <laughs> Muchísimas gracias. At this time, I would like to bring a close to this session. And, um, and now I will announce the winners of our book giveaway. For today, participants have been randomly selected to receive one of Juana's books, one of her latest books. And these participants are Joy Demarius Lance, Robbie Hertnicki, and Sean Rojas. Congratulations to all of you who have won this book and I'm sure you will continue to come back to our webinar sessions at the um, International Leadership Association. Gracias, thank you, and have a wonderful day. Adios. Adios. Vaya con Dios.